It's Two on the Isle with me, Charles Gross, and Leslie Hoban Blake. Tonight, reviews of Art Hamlet, Because I Could Not Stop, Hershey Felder as Irving Berlin, and the 2018 Broadway Flea Market auction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two on the Isle. And hello, Leslie. Hello, Charlie. Well, what is interesting about tonight? Well, thank you for giving me the chance to say something about that. I noticed as we were preparing that we have three shows that are biographical, but very different from one another, totally different from right. one another. Because we absolutely need a biography of Hamlet. <laughs> Bernhardt's Hamlet, if you will. And, and this is all, this is 95% based on fact. I went back and checked a bunch of things. It is, it is a play for theater buffs, if not theater nerds, because it's, it's so rich in theater history. It is, when, when, in 1897, when Bernhardt was 55, 53 years old, she decided to play Hamlet, a young man of perhaps 17. However, she decided to play him older, which was fine. Um, and that's been done a lot in con contemporary times. And um, her ne'er-do-well son, Maurice, who had spent all her money, decided that this was not a good idea because he didn't think she'd make any money. And according to the play, her lover, Rostand, Edmund Rostand, who was to write the great Cyrano, um, but, but, but he wasn't really her lover. That's the one thing that, that Rebecca took, but I didn't mind it at all. And um, told her that was not a good idea because she was, after all, a woman. He didn't say an older woman, he just said a woman. <laughs> and she was Smart forceful. Man. Yes. And she's talking to, to Janet McTeer, who is six feet something, three, I think. And, and who, who plays said, Bernhardt. Who plays Bernhardt and also played Petruchio. And, and she says, I, I want to play it, and it's my role to play, and why can't a woman play it? And, and so it made it very contemporary in that sense. It's like a woman can do right. anything. But here, here, are, here are the problems that I had with the play. Okay. Number one, that is the alleged part of the play. But No, the only alleged part is the Rostan. Everything else is true. No, no. The alleged plot of the play, in other words, we're telling people that's the plot of the play, but in fact, yes. that takes up a very small part of the play. In fact, at one point during the second act, we are treated to a very nice scene from Cyrano. Yes, but the whole first act is, but is leads up to that. Well, oh, no, 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 well, no, no. but it, it, it seems to me that that takes up a very small no. part of the no. production. It's, to me, my takeaway was this is Bernhard, the people in her life, the trials and tribulations of doing Hamlet, especially the way she wants to do it. And the major takeaway is what an amazing actor Dylan Baker is because we see him as one of uh, Bernhardt's co-stars. We see him playing the father in Hamlet, the king, and then we see him playing Cyrano. Well, and and he's, he, the person he's, he's playing, the real life person, is Coquelin, who was the, pre he became, as a result of Cyrano, the primo character actor of all of France. He made a fortune. Um, Redmond Rostand should have been his lover. But in any and, case. And, and Baker does him justice. But yes. Janet McAteer, play, Ma McTeer. Uh, McTeer, excuse McTeer. me. I'm, I'm, it's okay. I'm thinking of an old teacher of mine. Uh, Janet McTeer is the one thing that Sarah Bernhardt never was. She's subtle. No. Compared to Bernhardt, no. yes. See, here's an interesting thing. The, 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 the playbill says mm -hmm. that she was the mother of naturalistic acting. That's right. a lie. She wasn't. She was. She flailed around. She threw herself because we do have one piece of film right. about. Of course, her. you can't judge a Nicole career from no, one clip. No, you can't. But, but it was a pretty good indication. And mm -hmm. and actually, her her arch nemesis Eleanor Duza, who's mentioned, was the mother of naturalism. She was right. the one who played things small. Du uh, Hamlet uh, Bernhardt never played things small, and McTeer may not be big enough. That was your problem. I mean, she's tall enough, but she may not be big enough. Exactly. I found her to be just right. I, I found her to be believable in the scenes that were not in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, and the pictures that we're going to show show her very interestingly in this outfit, which makes her look very, very attractive, maybe handsome, if you will. Then she puts on a woman's gown, and she I thought she looked dowdy in the woman's <laughs> gown because she's a big woman. She has a smaller head. She has a, a lanky frame. She, men's clothing suits her, you know, or or a more tailored look would suit her. Uh, but anyway, that's, a, that's another story. And, and to me, the most, unfortunately, the part of the play that I found most interesting yeah. was the Cyrano scene. Well, that's in the second act, though. But again, if you have to bring in Cyrano to make the play, there's, there's a problem. And the scene between her and uh, her, her son, uh, nicely played Maurice, by Nick uh, yeah. Westrate, who is not at all, who is not portrayed here 
as the cad that he was in yes, real life. Yes, he was a real cad. He spent but all here he seems had. like the nice, well-adopted son. Mm. Kind of reminds me a little of Avery on the new Murphy Brown. Very well-adjusted considering who his mother was. Well, yeah, okay, that's an interesting thing. Um, uh, what I wanted to, uh, to talk about in particular is the fact that, first of all, the director is Moritz Van Sturpnegel, and <laughs> I know you wouldn't take a shot at that. I'm, I'm doing my best with and that. And the writer was Theresa, Theresa Rebeck, Rebeck my bo- which is much Rebeck, easier to pronounce. Whom I've already mentioned, uh, who took a little bit of liberty with the Rustan thing, but the rest of it which is, you know, you know spot far on. for the course. And Jason Butler Harner plays Rustan, by the way. He's mm-hmm. the, he's a very dashing figure. Yes. And Matthew Saldivar plays Alphonse Mucha, who did all those fantastic portraits of. Of, of Bernard that we know of the posters of and, and in, in, in in addition to the Hamlet, but also um, tins, uh, cookie tins and whatnot because they sold them as souvenirs. So there was merch even then, you know. Right. So your conclusion? Oh, I loved it. I loved every second of it. You know, it, 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 I, I mean, I was I was practically bathing in it. I was having right. such a good time. I, I have to say, I was lukewarm to this. I, I felt the play really is not to me. The play was not about a woman portraying Hamlet, or so much as it was about putting on their type of production of Hamlet, so w- with the other factors. And I found it enjoyable, but certainly not to the uh, level you there give. I, I, I will give this. I don't think this was about a woman playing Hamlet. This was about Bernhardt playing Hamlet. That's a but very a, again, thing. but you, the plot that you said was the trials and tribulations of a woman playing Hamlet. That well, is how you I described it at the beginning. I don't believe that's how I said it, but okay. That, that, I, I, okay, I was right. trying to find a plot and, and line I will give it 3.5 playbills. I would give it five. To ba- I really? would give it okay. six if I could. And by the way, Beowulf Barrett did the, se- the, se- the set design, which I really loved also. Okay. He's, he's a, one of our favorite designers. Okay. All right. And if you thought I had a problem describing <laughs> the Bernhardt play as about a woman trying to play Hamlet, well, wait till you see what's coming next. This is called Because I Could Not Stop, an encounter with Emily Dickinson, which, and we do encounter Emily Dickinson. And uh, unlike the Belle of Amherst, she spends most of her time doing her poems. But this is also an encounter with Amy Beach, who was a composer. And there's this very nice uh, string quartet with a piano. We have pictures of them, Um, yes. And when... uh, uh, Angela Page is Angelica not. Page. Excuse me, Angelica Page is not reciting as Emily. We hear musical pieces um, played by this uh, by this band, occasionally with a uh, soprano, Christina uh, Bacharach, who was lovely. Who was lovely. Bacharach, who was lovely. But the question that I have, and I don't even think you can answer this, no. is <laughs> what does one have to do with the other? Because I think one of those songs come, was her, one of the poems Only set to music, poem was hers. but otherwise we it might have been... It made no sense. Yeah, there, there was no connection with these two shows. The theater company that does it, the with these two, yeah, yeah. does like to do this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It would be very helpful if they, they, they made a point of doing it, if all of the poems had been Emily's, it might have made sense. And I just saw two years ago, or even less than that, uh, Cynthia Nixon do this wonderful movie, very quiet, mm-hmm. internalized Terrence Davies movie, right. um, which was much more everybody's idea of Emily. This is the, the, the most angry, the most frustrated. Oh, hold on. I'm okay, thank you. Get your microphone. Okay. Yeah, and we also, there was a revival of the uh, Bella Van no, Hurst. Uh-huh. Okay, and we just broke the microphone. I'll hold it. All it's right. fine. I'll hold it. So, uh, so anyway, um, but this is so out of character for anything that we know in, 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 in going through Emily's work and in other performances well, of Emily. it's not so much that it's out of character. I, I thought the character... Well, char- nobody was there, I so thought we the don't character... Know. Also, there are screens that uh, tell us a little about Dickinson's life and what was going on... It was like watching a silent movie. At the time. They it, had it, pictures <laughs> and they had words. And I'm going like, why are they doing this? Yes, yes. It really <laughs> did not makes sense. I'm sure there's a method to the madness. I'm sure there's a plan, but it was not evident, at least not for me, it was opulent. on stage. They 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 costumed the the piano was was see through. It was acrylic. I mean, uh, but that it wasn't about the piano, you know. It, it, at least not according to. Uh, and this is James uh, Mello who uh, wrote this, and yes, uh, and Donald T. Sanders and Donald T. Sanders uh, who. Um, Directed and was he was the music Mello was also the musical director to the best of my right. knowledge, and they, they, this particular company which is called the um, I have to look it up. Um, so sorry, I don't really remember. 
ensemble. Uh, no, ensemble no. for the Romantic century. So right. that's what they, they they like the whole romantic thing, and that they they put pretty well. You, you got the sense of it being romantic. Yes. But, but yeah, <laughs> but. All right, and you will give it. Oh, I get to lead on that, huh? You do. I got the last one. I didn't. 2.5. All right. I and by the way, they made poor Angelica Page lie on the floor with her back to the audience listening to the music. And I thought, oh, give me a break. <laughs> you know, what a waste of an actress, truly. I'm yeah. sorry. Well, I'll, I'll give it two playbills. Okay. Now, uh, now finally, have... truth in advertising. Yes, and we have another one-person show, and it's musical, and it's Hershey Felder as Irving Berlin, and Be Still My Heart, because I love Irving Berlin. Everybody loves Irving Berlin. It was a sing-along. Unfortunately, it was in the key of F sharp, which which Hershey tells us as Irving is the only key he knew how to play in, because he only played on the black keys. Right. I well, only he, sing. He, he actually, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I only sing sing in the key of C. So I couldn't sing along because it was in some weird place that I couldn't read. But well, he actually had a special piano with a uh, lever that would shift it over right. so that he could play in a key that you could yes, sing. But he wasn't playing in that, that night. Right. But, but well, I don't was, think Hershey Felder needs a lever. It was like a rock concert because he turned around to the audience as he started a song and he went this way and he conducted the audience. And the audience mm -hmm. sang. The audience sang, and I had tears in my eyes at a certain point. And when he played America, man, I just... Now, this is a little Given Russian Given that boy. this was Irving Berlin, I, I would have said Mitch... Uh, oh, sing along with uh, Mitch rather okay, than a rock right. concert. Well, when I, I don't when think I he say, liked rock and roll that no, much. No, no, no. But I'm talking about what happens at rock concerts right. now when they're all, you know, Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. 74, sure. and every, everybody knows the songs better <laughs> than he does, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, that's... He's having his eighth child or ninth child right now as we speak. Anyway, I'm sorry. But, but, but Irving Berlin was a little Russian kid who came here when he was five years old. His name was, his name was Izzy Balin, and he thought it was more American to be Irving Berlin, which is really very funny. And they lived on the Lower East Side, and and you know it was, it was a, an immigrant story like you can't believe. And he's listed everywhere as the American composer Irving Berlin, and I think right. that is so beautiful. Well, look at his list of work: uh, the score for Annie Get Your Gun, which includes "There's No Business Like Show Business, okay. Doing What Comes sure. Naturally," etc. "White Christmas," which we learn in the show was actually a very personal song to him because his wife um, was not Jewish and Christmas was a very important uh, and they missed this they were in California when he wrote they it they were sitting he, by it, the pool and he missed uh, <laughs> and he so missed I the, am dreaming the, of a white snow. Christmas yes uh, we had previously seen Hershey as uh, Leonard Bernstein very different um, though Leonard would well, have looked down on this show because it's for the it's for the audience Leonard was up here you know Leonard was well the Leonard looked down on George Gershwin yes, as we found yes, out in the yes. show Irving Berlin was not a classically trained. No. He was not trained at all. No. As a matter of fact, um, Hershey is a much better pianist and a much better singer than uh, Berlin was, as Berlin would have been the first to admit. By the way, you can go on YouTube, 1969, the Ed Sullivan Show, Irving Berlin singing "God Bless America." Right. I don't know how old he was in 1969, but anyway, that he's there. Right. Well, uh, yeah. Well, he he lived. I think uh, he did. He had Pat to be past a hundred. Yeah. He's 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 elderly um, when the show starts. He gets up out of a wheelchair and goes back to becoming young and and stays right. at the piano. Pretty and a few much other songs. That. Alexander's Ragtime Band. Um, well, that goes back to the beginning. That was one of his first. Yes. Big hits. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. When he um, was in the army, he actually yes, wrote that when he, he was in the army. Easter Parade. Well, the the interesting thing is he wrote he wrote us he wrote a show for World War One. And then he wrote one for World War II, which he was in, and he sang, Oh, How I Hate to Get Up in the Morning. It's in the and, movie. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was a stage hand listening, and he heard Berlin singing, and he <laughs> turns to the another stage, and he said, you know, if the guy <laughs> who wrote this song could hear the way this guy is singing it, he'd turn over in his grave. <laughs> Funny story. Yeah. The, the thing and about that, that Ellen, is included. The thing about Ellen Berlin is not only was she not Jewish, mm -hmm. but she left her rich family to yes. move in with a struggling songwriter, right. and it changed his life. And and it, it, the song that he ends with, I think it's close to the end, is always, and it's schmalsy the way he does it. The audience is singing, "I'll be loving you always," but Leonard Cohen just before he died did a version of Always. It's, it's, it's a classic that's in our DNA at this point, and he made it into an anthem, right. you know? Well, Jerome Kern, I think it was, once said 
Irving Berlin has no place in American music. He, he is, is American, American music. music. Absolutely. And he was an amazing composer. I mean, there were tragedies in the, his life, the loss of a child, the loss of his first wife, yes. uh, on very, a disease that she uh, yes. uh, caught on their honeymoon. I think it was in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, so there are the tragedies, but he was, I don't know if, si less, less complicated man than, um, oh, yeah. than Bernstein, oh, yeah. certainly. And humble. Yes. Even if the, even with all of that humble, be, you know, like like a gift. It's a gift I have. It's not like you know, I'm not right. the smartest guy in the room. I, it's a gift. And, uh, right. But uh, I, I enjoy the, oh, the set wise. There's this what I call a magic picture uh, behind him that yes, shows scenes. It this actually sometimes right it turns into the wall, the whole wall right. show, showing the scenery. All in all, there are just too many of the Berlin songs to include. But he gets you know so many of the nice ones, and it really is to my mind, a very nice tribute. It's Hamish. <laughs> it's, all right. That's, that's it's a word home. that Irving Berlin would have recognized. You would have loved the word, and it's home, and you just sit there, and you go. I had a little dis mis misunderstanding with the woman sitting in front of me, mm -hmm. and by the end of the show, we were apologizing to each other with tears in our eyes, going, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say anything to you before. You know, I, it just, we, and it was, it was like that. So right. what would you give it? I would give this four playbills. I would give it 4.5. You know how I feel about Hershey. <laughs> uh, we, we love Hershey. He's doing a Tchaikovsky thing for one night only in the, in the next week or so, which we're not going to be able to get right. to. Which is, which is interesting because that's, well, that's, that breaks him out of uh, doing Jewish Broadway composers. Yes. <laughs> so I guess that's going to be a stretch for him. <laughs> but Tchaikovsky did play the piano, didn't yes, he? Yes, so I guess, yes. Well, it's always so about maybe, the piano. Maybe it's a small stretch. So now you have something wonderful to share with us, don't I you? I do. I do. You know, um, it's an annual. Um, and well, we, we try to make it an annual. Uh, the Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS organization that every year holds this flea market uh, in Times Square. And all the Broadway shows come uh, and participate. And, and the stagehands and the Directors Guild. and Stagehands, the swings, anybody who was not performing lighting. that yeah. day. Um, well, we didn't catch, catch this on camera. Certain uh, Broadway stores we were giving out autographs earlier in that day, and you get all sorts of interesting merchandise, and every year I try to go down and talk to the people who are making it happen, so let's take a look. 525,600 minutes. It was the 2018 Broadway flea market and auction. But this year, someone had the great idea to bring a piano. We brought a piano to Broadway. We've never had one here at the flea market. We did, yeah. We're so happy to be here at the Broadway flea market. This is our first year here, um, although we're not new to Broadway Cares and the Broadway community. Um, so this piano here is one of 50 that Sing for Hope had artists paint uh, this year. Um, we do 50 every year, so it's actually our 450th. Um, so this piano spent the month of June actually just around the corner in Times Square, and now it's on its way to a permanent home in a public school. As always, the theater community came together to offer some interesting merchandise. Uh, what was it like having Supergirl as your leading actress? We had Melissa Benoist as um, our Carol King. She was amazing. She was so sweet, so talented, so hardworking. She absolutely loved being uh, a part of our cast, and we loved having her. Okay. And what great items are you, uh, do you have today? Well, we have these playbills signed by Melissa Benoist. We also have um, playbills signed by our current cast, kind of from the last year. This is really cool. It is original artwork created by Brian Strumwasser, who works in our hair department. And as you can see, there are only 200 of them made. So these are original artwork, and these are all signed by Jesse Mueller. We have an assortment of some uh, signed items from some of our writers, uh, including some scripts, some programs, and um, interviews. <laughs> what does the Dramatist Guild have to say to aspiring Broadway writers? What do we have to say to aspiring Broadway writers? <laughs> Join us and we can help you in your career from aspiring to mid-career to successful. Every year we do a bake sale, as you can see. Um, Everything on this table was homemade by either a cast member, a crew member, a stage manager, or an orchestra member. And it's very convenient because your theater is literally right here. You're standing in front of it. This is true. This is true. 
Okay, now, can I get a pair of ruby slippers at this booth? <laughs> well, we don't have a pair of ruby slippers this year, but we do have these beautiful Glinda shoes right here. Like this, like this. We've sold a bunch of them throughout the day, so we had some pink ones this morning. We've had some good stuff. Yeah, uh, one of our top sellers today has been uh, these pillows that were made by someone who works in the costume shop out of pieces of the costume. Um, and we've also been selling, you can look over here, uh, the monkey mask, which is the, the mask that is used by the monkeys in the show. This is the last one that we have. Do, do they come with wings? No, I wish. Oh, God, have we ever sold wings? I don't think so. I don't think we have either. So keep keep looking. Future yeah, keep your eyes out. Um, my favorite thing that we have today is this uh, window card from Intimate Apparel, which is a play that Viola Davis did with us um, back before she kind of blew up into <laughs> superstardom. Um, so it's really cool to see some stuff kind of from the archives, uh, you know, out and seeing the light of day. <laughs> and I see you have something from Skin Tight. Yes, we have some stuff from Skin Tight signed by Adina Menzel. Um, we were very excited to work with her this summer on a new play at, at the Pels. Our favorite prize possession is Lynn manuel Miranda's actual Hamilton robe. Right here, going for $500. <laughs> and did he, act, did he actually wear that robe? Allegedly, he was naked in this said robe. <laughs> Allegedly. I wasn't there. In other words, under the robe, he was completely naked. I, so they have told us. I see. Okay. We are trying to sell stuff for a good cause. <laughs> so, yes, he was naked. We are particularly in, uh, honored to be here in honor of Michael Friedman, who passed away last year, and to really support the amazing work of Broadway Cares. And Michael Friedman was. And uh, Michael Friedman was an artist who worked with a lot. He is known for Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, Forts of Solitude, his work with the civilians, and just an amazing, amazing artist and friend of the public. The thing we're really excited about is that we actually have window cards from Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. We get asked for these every single year. And so we were actually uh, able to reprint some of these just for the flea market for people for this year. Right, well, we actually have a brand new poster that's not even sold yet at the theater, signed by the cast brand new kind of campaign with the uh, characters all up here for you. We have some signed Pride playbills. We have some signed regular playbills. And then we're actually uh, the first all-female band on Broadway. So we have these awesome drumsticks signed by the ladies of the band. So, and yeah. I see you also have guitar picks. We have guitar picks because our lead guitarist, Anne Klein, is selling her solo CD right here. And that comes with her own personalized guitar picks with her name. Uh, her name is on them. Yeah. Okay. And you tell me, who, tell me who you are. Hi, I'm Holly Lasana. And you're with? Paper Mill Playhouse and from Milburn, New Jersey. So you had to come all, everybody else had just had to come up like across the street. You had to come all the way in from New Jersey. Absolutely. It's for a good cause. And it certainly wouldn't be a Broadway flea market without the bears. So, hi, I'm Rachel's mom from Rachel of Rachel's Bears. Rachel's 13th year here. Is that Rachel next to you? No, this is Rachel's best friend from kindergarten because Rachel got married last night. Mazel tov. Um, so we're filling in. And uh, we're selling here, backing up, um, Erzuli from Once, Upon, Once on This Island. And Leia Salonga graciously donated a signed playbill. And her happy new owner is a huge Aaron's and Flaherty fan, Ronnie Krasnow. You just bought this bear. I did, because Once on This Island is my favorite show of all time. Um, and this is the coolest bear ever. And look at all the detail in her. And how old was Rachel when she started this? Rachel was 13 when she started. She's 26 now. Right. And she's married now? She's married. She married last night. And um, she's on her way to Japan for her honeymoon. And after a long day of flea marketing, how does one unwind? Well, this is Broadway, so you sing, of course. Off the key, apparently. I'm Charles Gross. She was good. You know what I mean. It, 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 it's really, I think this is your best year of doing this. I Thank really you. want to compliment you. Um, I think you got some really fascinating things. And Next the best year, I part, will sing on key. <laughs> Well, next year you should be at the piano and let the let the camera take care of itself. But um, I, it, the amount of money this year was just it was the second highest they've ever made. It was nine hundred and seven thousand. I think rounded off. But but just to, to, just to briefly to say that the theaters the the I forgot the theaters um, do 
a competition every year where they come around with buckets and they say, okay, it's that time of year and we want you to give. And Because it's not just for AIDS anymore. It's for indigent actors. It's for uh, breast care awareness. It's for the Phyllis Newman thing. Well, that's it's, breast cancer. Right, right. but I mean, it's women's health. It's all kinds of things that have to do with actors right. and, and being able to take care of themselves or... or yeah, they used to do this in the old days um, for the benefit of Mr. Kite. That Beatles song is is about a, a benefit that's being done. So it's to the benefit of the actors. And um, that's all. I just think it's a wonderful organization. I think they do a great job. It is, job. And, and it's always a fun time to be there. As, as you can see, the people are just so enthusiastic. Absolutely. They really have uh, just such a, such a wonderful time and, and the crowds that but they the get. But the level of the merch has gone way up. I mean, when I first started with it, when it was like two or three years in, into it, we would drag all the old playbills out. We didn't have signed stuff. The shows weren't really part. I mean, the people in the shows were participating, but nobody had organized the merchandise in such a way. And now, uh, given the way what you showed us this year, I mean, it was really high class merchandise, you know. Right. Right. So. Well, the public was even uh, printing out their posters. Yes. Yes. You know, re yes. Reprinting, reprinting the, the bloody, uh, yeah, bloody. So people do take it. I think it's evolved to a level, and of course, this year they had that piano, which was a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. I, I have to say that. That organization uh, is really great. They give those pianos to schools. I, I yeah. They, they. I think they put out. Uh, Quite a quite a few uh, well, they say every 100, year. 100, yeah. so. They they put them out all over and you all over the city, and you can sit down and you can play them. Just if you can sit down and play them. <laughs> well, yes. Well, there are plenty of people who can. Who can sure. Yes, and then just to just have a, a wonderful time. And it, it's such such a New York. It is thing. It is. It's crowded. Do. I would do it except it's crowded, and I'm not that secure on my feet, so right, I don't. Right, I don't. Uh, so, so I stay so, away from crowds. So, says the woman who did who toured in musicals. Yes. Well, stays that away from was crowds. then, and this is now. Okay. I mean, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And that is our show for the evening. And when you go to the theater, look for Leslie and me, us too, on the aisle with a microphone. <laughs> and I'm here with a waitress from Waitress. Hi, how are you? Good. And how are you spending the Broadway flea market this year? <laughs> I am flyering and living my best life. <laughs> so you hand out flyers for the show? Yes, so we're promoting a waitress discount. If you use a flyer when you purchase tickets, you'll save 40%. Tickets start as low as $48. That's pretty good for a Broadway musical. Yes, it is. It really is. And who's playing the leading role there now? Nicolette Robinson. Pretty impressive. Okay. And uh, are you enjoying the, have you had a chance to see the flea market at all? No, I have not been able to get down there yet. Hopefully it'll still be open when I get off shift. Okay.